Good evening, good evening, good evening, everyone. I want to welcome us all to FSM Daily Digital Show. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Very glad that you heard us. And I trust that you're here to help us to accomplish the show's two objectives. First, to glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And secondly, to encourage all of us in the Lord. Glad that you're here with us this evening. Glad that you're here with us. And I trust that you're here to help us to accomplish these two objectives. We were created to worship God. Worshiping God is in our best interest. When we worship God, is good for our physical health, our mental health, socially is good for us, even economically, because God teaches how to spend the very money that he gave us in the first place. He teaches us how to manage our, body, our money, and in so doing, it's good for us economically. So serving God is in our long-term and short-term best interest. So we're here to worship God, but we're not just here to worship Him because worshiping Him is in our best interest. We worship Him for the simple fact that He is God. All by Himself, He is God. We have learned recently on this show that Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man. 100% God and 100% man. And as such, He can identify with you in your struggle. He can rejoice with you when you're having a good time. And when you need to talk to God, he also is fully God. He can reason with us. And so Jesus is so unique. Jesus is so unique as a second person of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The three in one God. It's a mystery. We cannot fully comprehend how three become one. All three become one, but we can believe it by faith. Because for us to fully understand God, then we will be God, and we are not God. And that's the reason why the Bible made it clear that without faith, it is impossible to serve God. Is it without faith, it is in, impossible to please God. So we're here to worship our awesome God, Jesus Christ. Our awesome Jesus Christ, we're here to worship Him. And in the process of worshiping Him, we want to encourage you in the Lord. Because we worship Jesus best by encouraging each other. When Jesus was on earth, He summarized the Ten Commandments this way. Love God and love each other. In other words, serve God and take care of each other. And this is what we set out to do on, the day, on a daily basis. So I want to welcome us from, if you're on the Zoom platform, we say welcome. Facebook, YouTube. TCV FM Christian Radio, Twitter, if you're on the continent of Africa, Australia, Asia, Europe, North or South America, we just want to welcome us all to FSM Daily Digital Show. As it is our custom, we do have a great show for you today. Our 100 guest is my friend and my colleague in ministry, Dr. Lawrence. And whenever Dr. Lawrence comes to this show, he always bring a word from God to encourage us. Now, Dr. Lawrenson is one of the scholars among scholars, indeed a scholar among scholars. So he always brings this unique scholarly touch, while profound, but with simplicity, and to encourage all of us in the Lord. And so you, you're here for a great show this evening. You're in for a treat. You're in for a treat, as it is our custom on this show. But because this is a divine mission, please bow your head with me as I ask God, the Holy Spirit, uh, to encourage all of us even now. Good God of heaven, a new day with a new opportunity to worship you. So Father, in the process of worshiping you, help us to reflect on ourselves. In fact, Apostle Paul said we should examine ourselves daily to make sure that we're walking according to the word of God. So, Father, help us to do a self-evaluation even now. And, Father, if our thoughts or words and something that we have done is separated us from you, we pray now, Father, your forgiveness. Help us now to abide within the processes of your laws and your love. Oh, Father, in particular those among us who are sick and who may be having a rough day, oh, God, I pray that you will be merciful to them even now. Help them to experience the joy of the Lord. Send your Holy Spirit to cover, to cover them even now. And all of us, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
First, we want to call upon your Naldo Swift Health and Wellness Center uh, for sponsoring uh, this show this evening. Ornaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center, your one-stop shop for all your health and wellness needs. At Ornaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center, you'll find Primary Care Clinic, Frugal Health and Wellness Store. The Frugal Health and Wellness Store is a health store with a difference, offering supplements, herbal blends, teas, vitamins, essential oils, vegetarian meatless protein, and wellness classes. Call us. Let us cater for your events. When it is time to take care of your annual or chronic health care needs, visit the clinic or schedule a televisit online or by phone. Call us at 470-880- 8080 to make an appointment or visit ornaldoswift.com to book an appointment online. With over 38 years of practice, we specialize in internal medicine, general practice, mental health, wound and ostomy care. Dr. Palmer and his team invites you to visit Ornaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center, located at 5386 Snap Finger Woods Drive, Decatur, Georgia. While you're there, visit a natural juice and smoothie bar, sample or vegan salads and snacks at the in-store deli. You can call in your order at 770-900-900. 2679. Shop in store or order on DoorDash. Again, we want to thank the Arnold Swift Health and Wellness Center for sponsoring this show this evening. And if you have a business, and if you know someone who have a business and would like to sponsor a show or a series of show, we ask you to reach out to us uh, so we can um, work out the details. You know, God has no hands except our hands, no feet except our feet. We are an extension of who God is. And in the serving and the saving of soul, there's a role that God's God played, there's a whole role that only angel plays, and there's a role that you and I play. And so if you're a preacher, God wants to use the gifts that He has given to you. If you're saying God wanna use your voice, if you're a businessman, an entrepreneur, God also wanna use your, your business skill to help to expand his kingdom. So when you sponsor a show or a series of show, you help to expand the kingdom of God for, again, to reach the entire world, all hands on deck. We need all hands on deck. So if you own a business, and if you know someone who owns a business, please reach out to us so we can talk about how you can sponsor a show or a series of show. Um, next week, beginning next week, we're going to be broadcasting on a television net network where we're going to be broadcasting in 131 nations. And so if you have a business and you like to expose your business to 131 nations, then we can talk about the details as we try to expand the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. Well, with that being said, we want to transition into the next segment of the show, where we're going to hear a, a word from on high, a word from God uh, to comfort us in these difficult days. And there's no one more suited to give us a word of encouragement than my friend and my colleague in the ministry, uh, who is no stranger to this show, uh, Dr. Lawrenson. But just before we hear from Dr. Lawrenson, we're going to hear special music from Elder Marshall that we're going to bless our soul with special music at this point. When I think of how he came so far from glory came to dwell among the lowly such as 
Suffer shame and such disgrace on Mount Calvary. Take my place. Then I ask myself the question Who am I? Who am I that a king would bleed and die for? My will, thy Lord. The answer I may never know why he ever loved me so. And to an old rugged cross he'd go. For who am I? And I'm reminded of. His words, I'll leave you never. If you be true, I give to you life forever. I wonder what I could have done to deserve God's only Son. Fight my battles until they're won. For who am I? Who am I that a king would bleed and die for? Who am I that he would pray? Not my will, thy Lord. answer I may never know why he ever loved me so but to an old rugged cross he'd go for who am I but to an old rugged cross he'd go for who am I Praise God, praise God. You having a bad day, you meet, you need to be reminded that God go all the way, went all the way to Calvary Cross uh, for you. You are special. You are so important to Jesus Christ that he went all the way to Calvary Cross just for you and I. We are very special uh, to God. So you need to be reminded of that. We don't need to do negative things to ourselves or to other people. We need to remind it that Jesus loves us, love us so much that he gave up his, his own life so we can have life and have it more abundantly. With that being said, please help me to welcome our, our 100 guests at this time, my friend and my colleague, Dr. Lawrence. And Dr. Lawrence, welcome once more. It's always a privilege. I'm looking forward to hear a word from an eye to encourage me in the Lord at this time. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Pastor Bonaby, for your wonderful and kind introduction. And we give God thanks for this special song, this special selection, Who Am I? And we are reminded that if it was not for Jesus, we would not be where we are today and we would have no hope but thank god for jesus we can't take pride we can't take the credit we have to give the credit to the lord jesus christ amen uh this evening we want to look at the comparison of the book of revelation with the book of first samuels first samuels and revelation last week we we looked at the book of ruth and we learned a lot. And the reason why I'm doing this exercise is to help us to build trust, faith, and confidence in the word of God, knowing that the word of God is inspired, it is authoritative, and therefore we can trust, we can put our faith, we can 
surrender our lives to God through his word and live according to the principles outlined in the word of God. So first, we want to look at um, two, a, a chapter in Samuel and one in Revelation, and then we're going to continue from then on. The chapter we will consider is chapter 16, and the verse is verse 13 of First Samuel's. We find in that particular chapter that God gave specific instructions through the prophet Samuel told Samuel to go to the house of a man by the name of Jesse. Jesse was the son of Obed. Obed was the son of Boaz, and Boaz was the gentleman who got married to Ruth that we spoke about last week. And as we examine and look at the book of Ruth, we saw that the Messiah, the promised Messiah came from the lineage of Ruth and Obed. And as a result of this union came Jesse, then King David. In Matthew chapter one and in Luke chapter three, uh, the synoptic gospel writers gives us the chronology of Jesus's lineage. Matthew in particular, when you read Matthew chapter one, he gives us the lineage of Jesus from Abraham all the way down to Mary and Joseph. And in Luke, um, Luke took the genealogy of Jesus from Mary and Joseph and went all the way back to Adam the first man that was created by God. Amazing chronological connection linking the birth of Jesus Christ straight through to, uh, to David, to Abraham, to Adam. That Jesus Christ has in his blood flowing in his veins all nations of the world because he came to redeem all of humanity. And of course, we know that strangers have access to God through Christ because in the family tree of Jesus, we find strangers and Ruth was a stranger. She was not from the, the 12 tribes of Israel. She was from Moab. So there we find that even in the family tree of Jesus Christ, strangers are grafted. And Paul made allusion to that. Paul says, that if those of us who were strangers and foreigners from the commonwealth of Israel are connected through Jesus Christ. In Galatians 3.29, it says, if he be Christ, if he be Christ, if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So we are connected to the family tree of David, of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob through Jesus Christ. Spiritually, we are. Now, the, the importance of understanding the role of David as the anointed of God, it is because David was a type of Christ, Messiah King, and the prophet. David was a prophet. David was... David, um, David was a prophet and he was a king. Jesus Christ is prophet and king. So therefore, David really mirrored Jesus Christ and he, his, his reign and his rulership, his leadership point forward to the one who had been promised to the nation of Israel so that they look forward in the future for the coming of the Messiah. So when the Messiah came, he had to be anointed and, of course, occupy the position of rulership on the throne of David. Now, when we look at chapter 16 uh, of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16, 
we are told in, I want to read verse 10 down through 13 of First Samuel. Verse 10 says, again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord have not chosen these. The Lord have not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, I hear all thy children. And he said, there remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, send and fetch him. Send and fetch him. For we will not sit down till he comes hither. And verse 12 says, and he sent and brought him unto in. Now he was ruddy and whether of a beautiful countenance and godly to look to. And the Lord said unto Samuel, arise and anoint him for this is he. This is he, the one, the appointed, the anointed, the selected, the one that God designated. Now, you notice that in the text, as I read previously, Jesse had several other sons. They were older than David. They had the height. They had the strength. They had the look. They had the appearance of men of valor, men who are capable of doing the Lord's work. But the Lord is not looking on the outward appearance when he's selecting and anointing the one whom he designates to, uh, to be his, um, his, his progenitor. So now we have the selection of David. And when David was selected by God, David had, he was a young man at the time. He was mending and taking care of his father's sheep. He was a little boy, a shepherd boy. And now as a result of David's um, heroic role against Goliath, when he defeated Goliath, this great giant, who came against the children of Israel and intimidated them. And uh, his brothers were part of the army and none of them uh, had the, 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 the bravery to stand up against Goliath. And there came David. And then he stood up and he said, who is this Philistine, this uncircumcised Philistine who would blaspheme against God? Is there not a cause? You know, a young man speaking words of a warrior. And lo and behold, David took five smooth stones from a brook, put it in his sling, and went against Goliath. And the end result was victorious. David defeated the man Goliath. And as a result of David's bravery, because he had the anointing of God upon him. You see, the thing about it is, when you have the anointing of God upon you, no obstacle, nothing that stands before you will intimidate you because you have the anointing of God on you. And that's what makes the difference with those who are following the instructions of God. Those who are doing the will of God, no matter what obstacle you may face or opposition, you will triumph. You will succeed because God's mighty hand is upon you. The same thing goes for God's work. When God has ordained and he has a prophesied and prescribed that his work should be carried forward in a particular manner, no matter what the enemy may try to do to stop, to delay, he will not succeed because God says his work will triumph gloriously at the end. So David is an object lesson. The life of David is an object lesson to all of us, certainly to me, because in my personal experience as a minister, I have had to face and still facing oppositions. And I know Pastor Bonaby can identify with that. Many obstacles have stood in the way, many are opposing forces. But when we pray to God and we acknowledge the will of God in our lives and the work that we do for him, my dear friends, God will give us the victory. So there David won the battle. He won the victory and he became king. And even while he was still out there working as a shepherd and waiting for, the, for his turn to sit upon the throne of David, 
even though God had appointed him and selected him, the man who he was supposed to succeed tried to kill him, tried to stop him. But here is the beautiful thing about the lesson of David. David composed the Psalm, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. David acknowledged that whatever uh, direction his life takes, God is the one directing him. God has led him in the past. And that's key, my dear friends, as you listen to this presentation this evening. Because God has done it before, he can do it again. Because God has wrought the victory before, he certainly can win the victory again for you in your personal life. Now, as you look at this passage of scripture in 1 Samuel, and then we begin to look at what Revelation says, because what happened is we're talking about almost 2,000 years apart between Samuel and Revelation, but there is something that is similar. We are talking about the theme, the theme, the similar theme that we find in each of the Old Testament books. We find them in the New Testament, particularly the book of Revelation, which is the summary of the entire Bible. So that tells us and it reveals to us the inspiration, the reliability, and the authority that the word of God holds and that we could trust and depend upon the Bible. So now David, as he became king of Israel and he reigned on the throne of David, on, on the throne, the people saw the mighty hand of God working with him in his life. During the time of his reign, the nation of Israel was united. It was known as the golden age, the golden age of Israel. The entire nation was united. And David was able to conquer all the other opposing forces, the other surrounding nations, those who tried to oppose uh, and to stop the work of God, David was uh, able to subdue and to conquer all his enemies. Powerful. The history of David is one that is powerful. And now we look in the book of Revelation. When we look in Revelation, in chapter 5, verse 5, we saw that there was a book sealed with seven seals. And as the book um, uh, was the, the book was, was um, locked and sealed and not able to open, John was disappointed. John, was, John could not contain himself. But then the angel told him, weep not. I'm sorry, John was weeping. He could not console him himself. But the angel told John, weep not. For the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Now notice the parallel. Notice the similarity. Notice the Connection, the lion of the tribe of Judah. You know, the lion is the leading animal in the animal kingdom. They call the king of the jungle. And he takes the leading role in terms of leadership, powers, and ability to conquer. So now the personification or the characteristic description of the lion is attributed to the Messiah king because the lion is the king of the jungle. So the Messiah King came as a conqueror. And who is the Messiah King? The one who unsealed the books that were sealed with seven seals. And so because Jesus Christ came from the lineage of David, Jesus Christ came from uh, Ruth, came from Obed, came from Jesse, and um, he was anointed by Samuel. Jesus Christ was anointed when he was baptized in the river Jordan. The Holy Spirit came upon him and God and the voice of the father was heard. Behold, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So the same way Jesus was selected, anointed and appointed reflect that uh, he is the one that David represents in the Old Testament. And then in the last chapter of Revelation, the last chapter in the entire Bible, chapter 22, verse 16 of Revelation, Revelation 22, verse 16, here is what the word of God says. 
I, Jesus, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. Listen, this, the last book in the Bible, Jesus is saying, I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the root and the offspring of David. So Jesus is saying he's the fulfillment of how David ruled, how he was anointed. Therefore, he, David was a personification. David was a type of Christ, a type of the Messiah. Because Christ is telling us that I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Revelation 22, 16. So now we see how the Old Testament connects with the New Testament. Very, very significant, very important. And in 2 Samuel's, in 2 Samuel's chapter, chapter 23, we see that David had some mighty men that were selected to fight with him, to follow him, to in, in uh, conquering the other nations, the other nations. Those mighty men that were with David, they were men who had conquered and overcame the Philistines and all the other nations of Canaan. They fought as brave warriors and they won victory. In chapter 23, from verse 8 through 13, names of mighty men who overcame adversities, men who overcame adversities, they fought and they triumphed. In other words, they were overcomers. Now, why is it so important for us to understand how their role in the Old Testament has something to do with the people of God that will be living in the last days in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Revelation. Because in chapter three of Revelation, verse five, God says to those who overcome, I will give you mighty names because you overcame adversities, obstacles, Everything that the devil throws at you, you are able through the might and power of God to overcome. God says he will give us new names. So the men in the, uh, who fought with David in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23 verses 8 through 13 was a type of the men that will overcome in the last days. So because God selected those men who fought with David and gave them victory and power over the enemy, we have the hope and the confidence that we too shall overcome through the power of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So there we see that the Old Testament has object lessons. The Old Testament has ob object lessons to us living in these last days. What happened prefigured what will happen in the last days. And so now we turn to 1 Kings. We move from 1 Samuel, um, 2 Samuel to 1 Kings. Very interesting. 1 Kings, in 1 Kings, in chapter 17, verse 1. In chapter 17, verse 1, the Bible says that the prophet Elijah, the prophet Elijah, he stood against the wicked king Ahab and his wife Jezebel. And he prophesied and predicted that there will be no rain nor dew from heaven for three and a half years. So he prayed to God. That was a powerful man. His prayer, if a man's prayer could shut down heaven, I tell you, that man is powerful. He prayed to God and God answered his prayer and the heavens were shut for 
three and a half years. There was no rain for that length of time, for that period of time. So where do we find the parallel and the theme of no rain nor dew from heaven in the book of Revelation? Where do we find it? We find it in chapter 11 of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 11, very interesting parallel. And then um, we will consider a few verses there. Revelation chapter 11. Chapter 11 of Revelation. And I'm going to read from, I'm going to read more than, than what I wrote on this, on the, uh, on the PowerPoint here. Here's what the word of God says. And verse 10, verse 10, Revelation chapter 11, verse 10 and 11. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them. And after three days and a half, the spirit of the Lord of God from, uh, uh, from God entered unto them and they stood on their feet and great was, and verse 12 says, verse 12 says, and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither and they ascended to heaven. So now we find the, uh, the language, the similarity between the, the shutting of the, of the heavens uh, and um, in particularly verse 12, verse 12 says, and they ascended to heaven and the cloud, uh, um, excuse me, the motif of rain and heaven is mentioned there in those verses. But I want you to go up a little further up. A little further up um, in chapter 11 of Revelation, verse six, when you read verse six, verse six in Revelation chapter 11, verse six says, these have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. So the language of heaven being shut down and no rain, not dew, is a direct correlation with what we read in First Kings under the leadership of the prophet Elijah. Elijah prayed there was no rain for three and a half years. His prayer shut down heaven. So what was written in type, what took place, what transpired in type will have a symbolic, uh, a symbolic fulfillment in the New Testament. And all of these types versus antitype symbols and prophetic fulfillments has something of tremendous lesson for us today to have faith and assurance in the word of God to know that when we put our trust in God and his, his word, we will, we will overcome, we will succeed. Now, let us look at something in addition to, um, to this. We go to 2 Kings now, from 1 Kings to 2 Kings. In 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11, 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11, something very significant in 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11, okay? And um, somebody's at my door. I'm sorry about the disturbance that we are getting right now. Don't worry, Pastor. I cover for you. Please Don't, give me two minutes. No problem. I, I will cover. I understand Go ahead. We're okay. living in a day of age of, of technology. So do it. I cover you. I will and, be right back. Yes. And I, I just want to remind the entire world that we're living in a time of coronavirus. I think the mail, the mail person is delivering a package. So I'm, I have to get it. No what problem. I, go ahead. I cover. And, uh, you, know, and uh, you know, in the last days, as Pastor Lawrence and, um, take care of that issue here. I want to turn your, your attention uh, to, into Daniel chapter 12. 
In Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, and paraphrasing here, the Bible says, In the last days, knowledge shall increase. Knowledge shall increase. It shall run to and fro. And the fact that Pastor Lawrence is in the state of New York, and many people are listening to us live now, and at the very least, six of the seven continents from all over the world. We discover now that knowledge has increased. And it's, it's in keeping with our theme. Our theme is the preaching of the gospel. The preaching of the gospel. And also our theme text is Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Matthew chapter 4, verse 14. And the essence of this verse is that when this gospel is preached in all the world, then shall the hand come. So we see you now God have increased knowledge in technology increase knowledge in our understanding of the scripture so no one will be without excuse because God's intent is for the entire world to hear about this truth that Jesus Christ is the creator of the world Jesus Christ is the redeemer of the world Jesus Christ is the sustainer of this world and is coming back to reward us according to our works how we have executed the free gifts that he have given to us so now that pastor is back again it's a fulfillment of the very prophecy in daniel for knowledge has increased so we can simultaneously speak across the globe to tell this entire world that jesus christ is god back over to you pastor thank you pastor bonaby once again my apology to the listening audience as we look at uh, those passages that I have on the screen sharing with you, uh, the text we are looking at at the present is 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, the translation of Elijah the prophet. Now, we, we know that Elijah is in heaven right now. How do we know that? Because the word of God says so. The Bible says in verse 11 of chapter 2, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. That's what the word of God says. Elijah was taken to heaven in a chariot of fire. Now, in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, Jesus Christ took with him Peter and John on top of a mountain. This mountain is known as the Mount of Transfiguration. It got that name because Jesus, when he went up there with the disciples, he was transfigured. In other words, his bodily appearance was transformed. And lo and behold, as he was transformed, the disciples saw Elijah and Moses. They appeared with Jesus on the mount. What were they doing there with Jesus? That was about a couple of weeks before Jesus was crucified on Calvary. Jesus demonstrated to the disciples that he has power to take to heaven with him both the living and the dead. That's what Jesus demonstrated his followers on the mount known as the mount or the mountain of transfiguration. He has power to take to heaven with him both living and dead. Two men. Why Moses and Elijah? Because they represent the two classes. Those that are dead and those that are alive. You see, Moses had died and after he died, God took his body to heaven. We, are, we have this evidence in the book of Jude. The book of Jude describes the contention that was going on between God and Satan over the body of Moses. And God rebuked Satan. And God took um, uh, Moses to heaven with him. How do we know that? Because of his appearance with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. 
So Moses rightly represents those that have already experienced or, or taste death. And through the power of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, they will be raised from the dead. And they will be taken to heaven with Jesus Christ when he returns the second time. The Bible makes it clear. The Apostle Paul speaks of the resurrection. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. 1 Thessalonians. Uh, rather, 2 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. The Apostle Paul says, For the Lord himself shall descend with heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ, the dead in Christ, shall rise first. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And then he proceeded by saying, and those that are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. <clears throat> Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So at the second coming of Jesus, two things will occur. There will be the resurrection of the righteous dead. And there will be the translation of the righteous living. So those who are alive and remain at the second coming of Jesus Christ, they will be taken up to heaven together with those who are raised from the dead. Both groups, the living and the dead in Christ, will be translated to heaven. So now we find Elijah the prophet is a prototype of those who will not taste death, but who will be translated to heaven. That's why he was taken to heaven alive. And that's why he appeared with Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration. So now we have Elijah representing that group. What does Revelation say? Where do we find the correlation, the parallel, the theme of translation? Where do we find it in the book of Revelation? We find it in chapter 11 of Revelation. Revelation chapter 11. And we read a few verses there. We find... <laughs> something very strikingly similar. Strikingly similar in Revelation. And I'm going to read it in your hearing. Revelation chapter 11 says from verse 11, Revelation chapter 11 verse 11 and 12. Verse 11 says, and after three days and a half. Now notice in Kings, in 1 Kings chapter 17, heaven was shut. There was no rain. <clears throat> in chapter 17, there was no rain for three and a half years. Three and a half years, no rain from heaven. And now we are looking at the parallel Prophetic parallel in Revelation chapter 11, verse 11. After three and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. Can I have some water, please? Hello? And they stood upon the, um, they, they stood upon their feet and the great fear fell upon them which saw them. Verse 12. Verse 12 says, and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. Ascended. They ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. Translation. They were translated to heaven. Now, you know, today there are a lot of people who say, well, people are not going to go to heaven. But there we have 
the language of translation in heaven, just as Elijah was a type, then we find the antitype in the New Testament of people that will be translated. So it is clear. Now, following chapter 11, we again have evidence in the Bible, in, the, in Revelation, that clearly, clearly speaks of people that will go to heaven. People that will go to heaven. Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. You have a Revelation chapter 19, verse 1. Verse 1 says, And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. Hmm. Powerful, powerful stuff. After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. This is this is this is the word of God. So Elijah, whom God took to heaven, was a prototype, was a he was a symbol, it was he was representing those who will be taken to heaven afterward. So when you hear people talking about there's nobody going to go to heaven. They have not read the Bible in its entirety, obviously. Now let's look at verse 6 of the same chapter. Verse 6 says, And I heard as it were of the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us rejoice, let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife have made herself ready. The wife of the bride obviously is the church, the people of God. Those who have been found faithful to the Lord, those who followed him. So now we have evidence of people God will take to heaven with him. Now, let me go back again to Thessalonians. It's important that we, we narrow this down and we tie it in very, very strongly so that people understand clearly what the gospel, as Dr. Pastor Barnaby says, the gospel is about the good news of salvation. So when people die, they experience it. In fact, yesterday I had a funeral at my church. And I had to console and give, give hope to the mourners and let them know that death is not the end for God's people. The Bible makes it absolutely clear that death is not the end for God's people. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 16, for the Lord himself, I'm so glad that the Bible says himself, not another. It's not going to be an imposter. It's not going to be a, 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 a false Christ. It's going to be the real savior, the one who gives us life eternal, the one who paid the price on Calvary's cross for our sins. He himself, not another. He will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, the trumpet of God. And the, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Number one, first, the dead in Christ shall rise first. So those who have died in the hope of eternal life, they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ is going to come back for them. 
going to be another prophet. He's not, he's not going to send John the Baptist. He's not going to send Abraham. He's not going to send any of the leading prophets. It's not going to be Muhammad. It's not going to be Buddha. It's not going to be any of those men. The Lord himself, that's what the Bible is telling us, that we ought to take note, not another, but the real Christ. You see, the reason it has to be the Lord himself, because the Lord himself is the one who conquered death. He rose from the grave after he was buried. Early Sunday morning, according to Luke 23, 54, 55, 53 and 54, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He conquered the grave. And so he says, behold, I was dead. Now I am alive forevermore and have the keys of hell, which is Hades, the grave and death in my hands. So now Jesus Christ is going to, according to Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, he will come again. And when he comes, the blast of the trumpet, the blast of the trumpet, which echoes, it echoes the blowing or the sounding of the trumpet in the Old Testament. Remember the children of Israel, when they march over uh, around Jericho, six times, once a week, once a day, and on the seventh day, seven times, and then the priest blew the trumpet. And when the blast of the trumpet was heard when it sounded, the walls came tumbling down. God announced victory. And he is using that same symbolic language in Revelation to let us know that the enemy that had held his people bound thousands of years, death that had bound his followers, that he will blow the trumpet announcing victory and triumph. And the dead in Christ, it will penetrate the heirs of the sleeping saints who have been sleeping in the dust of the earth for hundreds and thousands of years. They will hear his voice and they will come up from the grave clad in immortality. Hallelujah to God. They will be raised incorruptible. And in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, the Apostle Paul says, and this corrupt shall put on incorruption this mortal shall put on immortality, and it shall be said, O grave, uh, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And so there, death will be conquered finally by Jesus Christ at his second coming. But that's not the end of the story. Paul says in verse 17, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17 says, Then, we which are alive and remain, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, which them, those who were dead and raised, and shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So now we find in the Old Testament, Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, was translated to heaven. Elijah did not experience death. He was translated without testing death. So now we have the assurance, the same way God took Elijah to heaven without testing death, at his second coming, there will be some people that will still be alive. And because they will still be alive at the second coming of Jesus Christ, Jesus will translate them, take them to heaven with him. Together with those who are dead right now. And I made the reference to Moses. Moses represents those who have tasted death and who will be resurrected. That's why the two men, Elijah and Moses appeared with Jesus Christ on the Mount of trans, Transfiguration. He was transfigured. So that transfiguration mirrors or it tells us, it reveals to us that when we will be changed at the second coming, we will be changed into the glorious body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
And hence the reason why when people read about the text which says flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God, meaning that we cannot go to heaven in our mortal state. We have to be transformed from mortal to immortality. So that's what Paul is telling us in uh, Corinthians and in Thessalonians. So we have hope when we look at those Old Testament passages, we looked at the theme and its fulfillment in the New Testament. So when we look at, I'm going to end with first Corinthians chapter 15, first Corinthians chapter 15. And the apostle Paul clearly says to us in verse 51, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In other words, what Paul is saying, not everybody will die or not everyone will experience death. Some will die, some will not. Because when Christ comes the second time, there will be people that are still alive. But notice he, he used the word sleep because those who die in Christ, they are asleep. But why are they asleep? Because Jesus is going to raise them up. You remember the story of uh, Lazarus. That was another very epic narrative that brings the truth home. Jesus told Mary and Martha that their brother was not dead, but asleep. He told his disciples the same thing, that he's going to wake him up. Lazarus had died, uh, had been buried for four days. Four days, and yet Jesus would tell them that Lazarus is asleep after he had been buried for four days. Even, even Martha told Jesus that his body stinks because it has been there for four days. You know, Jewish people will not come in contact with a dead body after 48 hours because they consider the dead to be unclean ceremonially. In Deuteronomy it says, you shall not touch any dead carcass. So this is why even today, Jewish people, when a Jewish person dies, they do the, the funeral the same day, same day. So now Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from sleep because the child of God, death will not have victory over the child of God. So the child of God is only asleep because Christ is going to raise him up. So when we preach through our services, we give comfort to people. And this is what the apostle Paul says in verse 15. Verse 15 says, um, Behold, I verse 51, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Verse 52. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, you notice he says the last trump, the, the I mean trumpet, the last sounding of the trumpet. And in Thessalonians, he says, at, when he shall sound the trumpet, the dead in Christ shall rise first at the sounding of the trumpet. And there he is going back to that same trumpet sound, the blast of the trumpet that I mentioned about announcing victory over death. And then he says that the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Because we cannot enter heaven in the state that we are right now, sinful. No, we can't. We have to be changed from mortal to mortality, from corruption to incorruption. Verse 53 says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass 
the saying that it is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you afraid of death? Are you afraid of dying? You have so many relatives, friends that have passed away from COVID-19 and others who have died from various illnesses and sicknesses and conditions. We have our very good friend, Dr. Payne on this platform, night after night, evening after evening was there with us giving the statistics of all those who have who overcame, who uh, was succumbed by the pandemic. And uh, Dr. Payne is no longer with us today. But I want to let you know that Dr. Payne is asleep in Christ Jesus. Together with all those who have died, they are asleep because they died with the faith and the hope of Jesus Christ. And looking back at the Old Testament narratives and the lessons to be drawn from the Old Testament. It gives us assurance today when we looked at where we are today in the age of biblical prophecy being fulfilled. We are nearing the coming of Jesus Christ. We are closer than we most, most people think, most of us think. We are close. Jesus Christ is at the door. The question is, if he were to come anytime from now, are we ready to go home with him? Are we ready to be translated or to be resurrected? Are we ready to be changed from mortal to immortality? Are we ready to live forever with Jesus Christ? That's the question that we need to answer. That's the question we need to ask ourselves. So may God bless you tonight. May God fill you with confidence and hope tonight that this simple analysis of biblical exposition of looking at the Old Testament books and their fulfillment and the parallelism as we look at them through the lens of the New Testament, particularly the book of Revelation. May God bless you to develop faith and trust in his word. Appreciate it, Pastor. Clearly, I truly appreciate the knowledge uh, that you set before us, as I stated at uh, the top of the show. Whenever you come on this platform, you always bring uh, a reward of God in such a, a scholarly manner, but at the same time with simplicity. And I want to, I want to, I want to um, ask you a few questions about a very important. A school of thought that you have set before us. While well, there are many, but I want to focus on, 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 on a few. Uh, first of all, I want for it to be relevant to us, and you alluded to this in the presentation as well. We are losing so many people. We are losing so many people. May it be to cancer, heart disease, motor vehicle accident, or coronavirus. So I think it is fair to say that they are Many void within many of our hearts, many of our God's children hearts, and in many homes, they are, President Biden said it this way, they are empty seat at the dinner table because we have lost so many of those who we love, maybe the coronavirus and all those other um, illnesses. So are you saying now, Pastor, that there is hope beyond the grave? Absolutely. According to the word of God, according to the word of God, death is not the end for God's people. When a child of God dies, the child has fallen asleep and Jesus is going to wake him or her up when he comes the second time. You know, so this is why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 16 that we should, it's all right to cry and to moan because we are human, but let us not moan like those who moan. 
because we know that we shall meet our loved ones again. You know, you also mentioned two names, Moses and Elijah. Yes. On the Mount of Transfiguration. Yes. And you, you, you correlate them with two, the two bodies of people or two groups of people that will make it into the kingdom of God. You mm -hmm. said that Elijah represent one who never faced death because God translated him into heaven. And Moses, after leading the children of Israel for 40 years, first he was in Egypt for 40 years, then he was in the wilderness for another 40 years, and he led the children of Israel for another 40 years. But he disappointed God, if I may, by striking the rock versus speak to the rock. And as such, God said to him that you will not make it into the literal promised land as it relates to the Canaan, Canaan then. But we also know clearly that after God placed him on a mountain and showed him the promised land, the Bible said he fell asleep. And in other words, he, he, he experienced death in his body. So you're saying now Moses symbolized those that are dead in Christ that Christ will resurrect and bring to heaven, and Elijah symbolized those that never face death in their body, and both group of people, two different group of people, will be in see, enter into the kingdom of God. Is that what you're saying to us? Yes, according to the word of God. According to the word of God. Um, everything that happened in type in the Old Testament has its antitype in the New Testament. What was written in typology is being fulfilled in symbolism in the New Testament. So when we read the Bible, we have to compare prophecy with prophecy, law with law, history with history, psalm with psalm, poem with poem. You know, look at all the variants, varied forms of ministry as they were administered, the tabernacle, the sanctuary, the office of the priest, the office of the king, the office of the prophet. We have to look at um, the law in the Old Testament, the law in the New Testament. We have to look at the trumpet. I mentioned the trumpet, the numbers, all the different numbers, the number three, the number seven, the number 40, and their occurrences in the Old Testament has direct correlation with what is what was fulfilled in the New Testament. So it is not accidental, but providential that God orchestrates, he coordinates, and he guides the prophet to write those uh, biblical narratives in the Old Testament so that when we today read them, our faith will be strengthened and deepened and broadened in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me allow me to just read the text because I alluded to it in the interest of time uh, while I was doing the main core presentation. But since you asked the question, the question is for those who are listening who wants to know where this is taken from. Matthew chapter 17. This is where we find the lesson of the transfiguration. You said Matthew, Matthew, cha chapter, Matthew, chap Matthew chapter 17? Yes. Okay. Please in Matthew chapter 17. Okay. All right. And um, from verse 1 all the way down to, all the way down from verse 1 to, to 4, you know. Uh, verse 1 says, and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up onto a high mountain apart and was transfigured. In other words, his entire body was transformed. He was changed into a celestial form. Before them, and his face did shine as the sun. So that tells us that Christ um, was changed from the regular ordinary appearance and form like we are today into a celestial and glorified form, okay? And when the disciples saw him transformed, verse three says, 
and, and the Bible says his remnant or his outfit, his robe, was white as light. So imagine he shone like the sun and his garment was as light. So the brilliance, the brilliance that Christ appeared before them or transformed, transfigured before them, really blew them away. They were just flabbergasted. They were just men. Mariah, they could not understand what was really going on. Verse 3 says, and behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias. Elias is the name for Elijah. Okay? So those two men appeared with Jesus when he was transformed. And, and here's the key point, Pastor Barnaby. Here's the key point. That transfiguration is the type of transformation we will experience at the second coming of Christ. Praise God. So now Christ is giving them a preview of what is to take place in the future. And that happened just a couple days before his crucifixion. So Christ knew that he was going to experience death, but he was giving them the assurance that those two men, because they have been, they have gained victory over death, that he, they gained victory because of him. If it was not for Jesus, Elijah and Moses would not have been in heaven because death would have held them prisoner. But because Jesus conquered the grave and death, Elijah and Moses was taken up to heaven with him. And they represent, they represent those of us who will be alive or dead at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Praise God. You know, so God leave no ambiguity he make it clear and plain in respect to our salvation absolutely with that being said is there a statement or a question from those in the audience if you join us for the first time we are blessed to have as my colleague and my friend here dr Lawrence and Pastor Lawrence and Pastor in the New York area. And so if you're in the New York area and you're looking for a home church, we highly recommend Pastor Lawrence's church. With that being said, do you have a statement or a question on the show? We enter into a dialogue. You may have a statement or a question. Do you have a statement or a question? Good evening. Good evening. So what, what I'm hearing you saying is that all the families over the past year and probably 19 months or so who have experienced losses due to this COVID, that they can rest assured, they can be comforted that if they accept Jesus as their personal savior, they will be reunited with their family? Absolutely. Indeed. Indeed because they are they have fallen asleep okay, and I, jesus christ is go, going to reunite all of those who have died he will bring them, them back to life now you know um <clears throat> during the time of the early apostles uh people who died they some people had no hope they were crying and even when you go by archaeological finds and and um, discoveries on the tombstones of those who died during the first century there were epithets and statements that indicate that they will never see their loved ones again because death was seen and viewed as the, the final payment for sin. And therefore, if a person falls um, into death, uh, experience death, they will never be raised again. Even the Pharisees, um, not the Pharisees, the scribes, some of them did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in the resurrection. So on those tombstones, there were inscriptions saying, farewell, my loved ones, we'll never see each other again, or goodbye forever, goodbye forever. Um, so Paul, when he wrote to the church in Thessalonica, said to them, no, 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 do not mourn like those with no hope. Our loved ones will be resurrected again. You know? And then he said in the last verse, he says, comfort one another with these words. Now let's go to Moses. Moses did not enter the promised land, the land of Canaan. 
You know why? Because Moses disobeyed God when God told him to speak to the rock. And he, he, he smote the rock. He should have listened to the voice of God. And so God, and then he said, must we fetch water for you? And so Moses attributed out of anger and frustration, the people got him onto his last nerves, poor man. He disobeyed God and he took the honor. It was seen as though he was the one who was providing the water. And so therefore God had to tell Moses, for this reason, you will not enter into Canaan, but you shall see it with your eyes, you will not enter. The devil thought that because Moses had not entered Canaan, Moses was his victim and he would hold Moses prisoner forever in death. So let us turn to Jude verse 9. Jude has only one chapter. And Jude verse 9 says, Yet Michael the archangel, when he contending with the devil, he, he disputed he disputed, Satan now, the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, thus not bringing a, 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 bring a, against him a railing accusation. So Satan was disputing over the body of Moses. But in the last part, part B of verse 9 says, the Lord rebuke thee. See, the Lord rebuked thee. So which means the Lord stood for Moses. You know why? Because Jesus conquered death on behalf of Moses. That's why Moses appeared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. So even though, my beloved sister, even though we have had loved ones who make, made mistakes in their lives, um, let us say because of lifestyle, they didn't eat right, live right, and they die prematurely, they die early deaths. Let us not judge them. Let us not say that person did not live according to God's standard, therefore they're not going to be saved. If before they close their eyes, that they call upon the name of God, even though Satan will try to claim them, Jesus Christ will rebuke Satan on their behalf. Like he did Moses for Praise Moses God. on behalf of Moses. Praise God. Praise God. Is there a follow-up question or another question? I, I, I love that answer, Pastor. It's a beautiful uh, illustration there. You know, you know it, it, it remind me of Jesus' life and how God, even Jesus, act by faith. And in matter of fact, let, let me follow up with this, Pastor in the form of a question. Then, it is fair to say then, then that when Jesus, or when God permits both Elijah and Moses to enter into the kingdom, it was an act of faith on behalf of God. Because all of that was subject to Jesus' death and resurrection and living a perfect life. Isn't that an act of faith, knowing that someday Jesus will come and God took them into heaven before Jesus even walked on this sinful world, earth and go all the way to a Calvary cross? So God was exercising faith by having them up in heaven um, before Jesus went, through, went to the cross. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well said, Pastor. It, grace, well, grace and faith so powerfully interlocked and interwoven in the lesson of Elijah and Moses that I heard a great preacher one time says that this was a down payment. <laughs> Jesus made a down payment on behalf of humanity. So he took Moses and Elijah as a sample of what is to come. So this is why I read Revelation chapter 19 verses 1 and 6 that John saw a great multitude that no man could number in heaven. So to those who, are, who have not thoroughly studied the word of God and are teaching that people will not go to heaven, they need to take a real, um, real a deeper course on the word of God and to see 
the breadth, the length, the, and the height, and the width, and the internal evidence contained or found in the word of God that ascertain and proves that yes, God is going to take humanity to heaven with him in a number that no man could number. They will be raised from the dead as well as among the living. Praise God. With that being said, is there a follow-up question or another question or statement from someone else? Any other? Anyone? These are some deep theology there, Pastor. And, and as I show the audience, when Dr. Lawrence comes to the show, while he speaks deep theological thoughts, he said with simplicity. And that speak of his scholarship and his dedication to, to the Word of God and, and declaring the, the Word of God. So not only is it, again, he's te teaching us deep theology, but with simplicity. Now, I, I want to fast forward uh, to Revelation, um, the last book of the Bible. You also make a comparison, my pastor, and uh, with Revelation chapter 22, precisely verse 6. In verse 6, and you, 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 you link this to, um, to Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16, particular between verses um, 13, rather verses 10 to 13. And what amazes me uh, and when mean you... Verse 16, chapter yes. 22, verse 16. Yes. Right. Yeah, you, yeah, you, again, from, yeah, from, again, 1 Samuel, let's clear for the audience. 1 Samuel chapter 16, from verses 10 to, to, um, to even say 13 or so. And what you share with us, is that God chose David mm -hmm. even though David was the youngest of his other seven brothers. But talk, speak to that from a perspective of historically where God usually bless the first child will, if the first boy sometimes get one half of the entire wealth. And he you now has a responsibility to, to model for the other um, seven brothers. But we see here now something totally different uh, occurred here where Jesus now chose the younger versus the elder son of, of Jesse. Uh, how, what does this tell us now about how we have to keep our eyes on God because when God is moving and not in the usual way that we have to open our eyes to see Jesus and not necessary tradition. Could you speak to that, please? Yes, indeed. You see, Jesus, because he is the fulfillment of all the types and all the types points to him, all the, this, the, um, the, 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 rituals and all the sacrifices and all the, the all, all of the different um, things that were set in place in the New Testament points to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ changed the paradigm. In the Old Testament patriarchal era, it was all about the first, the first, the first, the first, the first, the first. And then in Revelation, when we look at the summary of the Bible, in chapter 1 verse 8 of the book of Revelation, Jesus says, I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and the Omega. In chapter, mm. chapter 21, verse 6, again, he reiterated chapter 21, verse 6. He says, he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, right? He said again in chapter 22, verse 16, and Jesus, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to these things in the churches, I am the root of David, this first, the, the, the bright and morning star. So Jesus Christ, not only is he the first that the prototype, the prototype points to him, but he is also the last, which means that after Jesus, there will not come another Messiah. He's the end. He's the fulfillment. The Old Testament was the prologue and the New Testament, the epilogue. Genesis, the prologue, the introduction. Revelation, the conclusion. Jesus Christ was prefigured in the first and in the type of the Old Testament. He is now the fulfillment 
as the last and the pro and the epilogue, the conclusion of the New Testament. So, with that being said, he has the proxy power, if I may use this phrase, um, to use either the firstborn or the, the, the younger son because he is the first on the loss. Uh, is that yeah. one of the messages it, you're communicating it's, it's, about? It's, it, it's not one or the other. It it's, is both. It's both. <laughs> yeah. He says, I am the first and the last. Not all the last, but the first and the last. So he represents the first and he represents the last. All those who were considered last, who thought that they had no chance, Christ represents us. And all those who were chosen at the beginning, he also represents them. Praise God. You know, as you gave us this illustration, what came to my mind uh, when Jesus gave a story about, went out to, to invite people to work, and one came at the first hour, and the other one came at the ninth hour, and they got the same reward. Yes. They get the same price. And so in that very illustration, is it also true that God was conveying uh, the salvi salvation process or the salvific message that it doesn't matter if you come in when you're a child or you come in when you're whole, God has a blessing a blessing for all of us. May we born and raised in church all the day of our life, or we were on the street acting like David, or acting like Moses, who were, or acting like Apostle Paul, who were murderers. It doesn't matter when we come to Jesus Christ, we will receive the same price that He will save us all from our sins. Or even when, or even if you come at your deathbed, while you're on your deathbed the last final hours of your life on earth, like the thief on the cross. If that's the moment you could say yes to God, you will be accepted in his kingdom and given full privilege just as the one who was first. Praise God. Praise God. You know because God, God cannot deal in partiality. God cannot show favoritism. If, if he were to stick on the notion of being a God of partiality, then he would be unjust. So God is not unjust, but just. This is why the judgment belongs only to God. If we as human beings were to be the, one, the ones to decide who will go to heaven and who will not go to heaven, a lot of people, including ourselves, will not make it. But Jesus Christ, he, you know, he is so merciful and gracious long-suffering that even the person who spent their entire life wasting away in the world, but if they could at the very last minute say, Lord, have mercy upon me. The Bible says, whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Praise God. You know, I have a final question and a statement. My final question to you, Pastor, is going to one of the texts that you shared us. I'm going to read it in your hearing, and I'm going to pose the question. Revelation chapter 22, and you precisely point us to verse 16. And I'm going to read it in our hearing. And it says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel and testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root of and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. What is Jesus saying to us, and you can include in thought to us here? Um, the, the star, according to the prophet Micah, at the entrance of the Messiah would shine. Micah says, a star shall arise. The star, prophetically speaking, refers to the birth of the Messiah King. This is why the, the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. And they asked, where is he that is born this day King of the Jews? For we have seen his star. We have seen his star. According to legends, according to legends, every time a, a specially, uniquely um, destined individual was born to 
be a great person in the earth, a star would be born. That's according to legend. So Jesus Christ, the biblical legend in the book of Micah, proved and states that at his birth, the signal, the signal, the sign of the birth of the Messiah King would be a star will appear. So the wise men who were studying legendary literature, including the Holy Scriptures, they followed that signal, that sign, and they found the Messiah King, Jesus Christ. That's why they brought gifts that represents his role as prophet, priest, and king. So when they brought those three kings, they fulfilled the prophetic pronoun, the prophetic statement that points to the... So now Jesus now, in the conclusion of all things, in Revelation 22, 16, he is saying that not only is he the root of David, but he is the bright and morning star. Christ put the capstone on the argument. <laughs> And he's saying for them, listen, that star that you've been talking about, I am he. By the way, Pastor Bonaby, do you know what is the symbol on the flag of the Jewish nation of Israel today? The star of David, same star. Now, it is pathetic or ironic that modern Judaism do not want to recognize Jesus, but the star is on their flag. So Jesus is making it so plain mm -hmm. that there will be no excuses if we're lost. That's right. That's right. And he, he alluded to the seven churches, which means the, throughout the lifespan of the Christian church, throughout the dispensation from Ephesus to Laodicea, every single epoch of the existence of of Christian believers, Jesus Christ is the one that stands and walks in the midst of his church or his people. The very one is the one that is proclaimed in the book of Revelation. Praise God. Pastor, that, that is a great way uh, to bring this show to an uh, end. It, it, is, it is a great way. You know, one of the points that Pastor have made uh, in his presentation, he mentioned that if you come at the first hour, the second hour, or even at the ninth hour, the third hour, or even the ninth hour, then you, your, God's grace is sufficient for all of us. Hallelujah. We're living in a days, an age of coronavirus, that many people are on the hospital bed are on hospice care. Many people are, doctors are, tell you clearly that you only have six months to live or two months to live or some of us even a few hours to live. Part of the reason why the gospel is good news, according to what the Bible says and what Pastor Lawrence and Dr. Lawrence has articulated clearly to us, it doesn't matter what your life has been like throughout the duration of your life this far. If you reach out to Jesus Christ, he will save you, even right now. Hallelujah. He will save you right now. And so perhaps there's someone out there under the sound of my voice that you live a, a life that was anti-Christ. You have cursed God, you have cursed Christ, and now you're laying in your bed and the doctor, our doctors have said that you only have a day to live are a month to live and you now are wondering can you still be saved based upon the word of God and what God has used is my servant Dr. Lawrence to share with us today that yes once you give your heart to Jesus Christ he will save you and this is why the gospel is good news. It's excited news. God has a plan for you. 
So we're asking you now to give your heart to Jesus Christ. And we not just speak because we want to say it. it is biblical. The Bible makes it clear that this moment is salvation. Harden not your heart. And for some of us, you may say, listen, I'm in good health. There's a man once that said that he had around 20 good years to live and he ended up died months later. You don't know if you have a thousand years to live or a hundred years to live or 10 years to live or 10 months to live. The, you and I, either we're in good health or in bad health. We need to give our hearts to Jesus Christ now. So we're saying now, let not this moment pass you by. Let not this moment pass you by unless you give your heart to Jesus Christ. We're not just here to give information, but we're also here to persuade you that it's better to serve God than to live without God. So it is our hope that based upon the evidence of Scripture and what Dr. Lawrence has shared with us, that we will give our hearts to Jesus Christ right now. In fact, Pastor, could you just pray to that end for us? I know yes. that there are many uh, among us, and you know, in fact, let's 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 open up for prayer. Maybe someone have a prayer request, but a part of the prayer request is uh, asking that you would you would pray for us that we may surrender our hearts to Jesus Christ. May we be young, old, may we be in good health, or just a few days are in these days sometimes even minutes that we have to live here on planet earth that's one of my prayer requests but let's open up for the wider audience probably someone have a prayer request do you have a prayer request that you like to add to what i've just said yes good evening i would like to pray for um, sister sarah her husband and her boys uh, that God will do something very special for them. I would like to pray for Mrs. Russ and for the launching of Final Shout Ministries television network coming up in a few days. Thank you. Thank you for that. I am for that reminder. Anyone else? You, the audience, please feel free to unmute the device, our devices and, and communicate with us. Do you have a prayer request? Going once, going twice. Well, Pastor, please, if you could just lead us into prayer at this time. Yes, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this ministry. We thank you for the word of life, the word of truth that has been presented to us in such a manner that we can say like the apostles said, didn't our hearts burn within us? For we have seen clearly, O oh God, that your word is authoritative, Lord. Your word is inspired. We have seen how the dots are connected between the Old and the New Testament. What was presented in type is being fulfilled in the anti-type in the New Testament. And that we have hope beyond death. And that death is not the final. But that God is going to give, give us victory over it. Our loved ones that have been snatched and taken away from us, they will be brought back to life. Yes, out of sleep and they will be clad in immortality. Father, I thank you for your, the, 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 the way you have blessed uh, um, Sister Ross and, and um, the other members of the family, her daughter. The, thank you for the way you have blessed um, the different names, Pastor Barnaby's uh, uncle and um, the other individuals who've been praying for the, the uh, Dr. Payne's family and the other members of Father, children, loved ones, older folks, Father, those who are being diagnosed with different illnesses and conditions and diseases. You are the healer, you are the restorer. You have never lost a case, God. You have never lost a case. And we don't have to remind you of that, dear God. But you know, as human beings, we are so frail and we are so weak. When we are struck with illness and the pain and suffering that, that our bodies, that we experience, that we feel, it makes us call upon you and have our voices to, to reflect how we feel. 
but we know that you are God who understands our sorrows. You understand our pain and trials and the tribulation that we go through. We want to do what is right. We want to serve you, Lord. That's, that's, that's what we want to do. We want to serve you. We want to be saved in your kingdom. We want to share the good news of salvation to those who are in the darkness of sin and who have no hope that they, when they hear this message, it will rekindle, it will ignite hope and rekindle faith in them. So the television ministry, Father, that is about to be launched, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will give complete victory, financial victory, technical victory, emotional, social victory, ministerial victory, you will give us victory, O oh Father, over every aspect. We know it will be challenging. But you have said in Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. When we take this gospel and we preach it to all the world, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, we know that you will accompany this work because you gave your life for that very purpose to save humanity. And you will not stand idly by and watch your work trended and struggled without you put your mighty hand in it. So the same way you perform mighty deeds in the hands of the apostles and prophets of old, we ask that you will do it through us today, Pastor Barnaby, his family, myself, and all the other contributors of FSM. Bless us with numerous gifts and blessings so that your name be exalted and glorified. Sinners will be saved and justified and saints will be sanctified. And at the end, when you come the second time, all of us, will be glorified, changed from mortal to immortality. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Pastor Chuli, I have been blessed. And I do believe... It is, it is, it is, it is a, a joy. And, and I'm telling you, um, each time I come on the platform, I feel refreshed. I feel replenished. Because, and I want to say to the listening audience, you, you have no idea how much joy this brings to me to share the word of God with you. Praise God. We receive it, my pastor. We receive it. And it is, the joy is also on this side as well. And so we pray that God will continue uh, to bless you your children will bless your ministry, will bless everything that you touch because you will surrender to him and your thought will be his thought, your words will be his words and the deeds that you do will be his deeds so he has no choice but to bless you because that who he is as our God. Amen. And with that being said, we want to thank the Arnaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center are for sponsoring this show this evening as well. Ornaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center, your one-stop shop for all your health and wellness needs. At Ornaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center, you'll find Primary Care Clinic, Frugal Health and Wellness Store, the Frugal Health and Wellness Store is a health store with a difference. Offering supplements, herbal blends, teas, vitamins, essential oils, vegetarian meatless protein, and wellness classes. Call us. Let us cater for your events. When it is time to take care of your annual or chronic health care needs, visit the clinic or schedule a televisit online or by phone. Call us at 470-880-8080 to make an appointment or visit ornaldoswift.com to book an appointment online. 
With over 38 years of practice, we specialize in internal medicine, general practice, mental health, wound and ostomy care. Dr. Palmer and his team invites you to visit Ornaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center located at 5386 Snapfinger Woods Drive, Decatur, Georgia. While you're there, visit a natural juice and smoothie bar, sample or vegan salads and snacks at the in-store deli. You can call in your order at 770-900-2000 seven nine shop in store or order on DoorDash once more we want to thank the Arnaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center for sponsoring this show this evening and we also want to remind you that if you have a business or if you know someone who have a business that would like to sponsor a show or a series of shows please reach out to us that we could talk about the detail so even if you don't have a business and you know someone else who do have a business, we want you to reach out to them and have them to make contact with us so we can have this discussion. Again, as I said at the, at the top of the show, God has no hand except our hands, no feet except our feet, and we are an extension of who God is. And God wants to use all of our giftedness, not just the preaching word or the singing word, but also the entrepreneurs, you who God has blessed with business and entrepreneur skill, God wants to use your talent as well to expand the kingdom of God. So by come and, and, and sponsor a show or a series of shows together, all hands on deck to build up the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our God is a holistic God that deals with the affair, affairs of our life. But again, we want to remind you about the solemn message that Dr. Lawrenson has shared with us, the solemn message that he has shared with us. And what is the message that Jesus is worthy of our praise? But most importantly, that no matter where you are in your journey with God, once you reach out to God and say, Father, I have sinned against you. Forgive me. God will forgive you. And then you will have access once more to the tree of life where we live forever and ever. But this is only possible through Jesus Christ. And this is only possible, again, by us surrendering to Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why the Bible says this moment is salvation and we should not harden our hearts. And as my wife has shared with us, that our next week at this time, we will launch the 24-7 television network that we're going to be broadcasting in 131 different nations of the world on cable and various and social media platforms where you have Apple TV, Chugo TV, Firefox, so many different platforms you're going to be able to watch us on the various app and so this is a God's way of trying to get the message out there to let everyone know that he is about to come and that we should give our hearts to him now, not tomorrow. So it is my prayer that you will surrender to God even now, even at this very moment. God bless you. Uh, good night. Uh, tomorrow we'll hear from um, Pastor Sertrell and the Tucker Twin and they're tuning in all the way from the UK and the island and in the continent of Europe. So again, my friend, Pastor Lawrence, Dr. Lawrence, thank you for blessing us in such a mark way.